On April 28, 1988, Aloha Airlines, on a routine flight from Hilo to Honolulu, Hawaii, suffered a catastrophic fatigue failure of the pressure vessel that carries the passengers on the aircraft. This was a Boeing 737. Prior to that, the first commercial jet aircraft, the de Havilland Comet, a beautiful example of an airplane, went into commercial passenger service in 1952. They were way ahead of the game and could have owned the industry. But no one really understood fatigue at that time and so there were catastrophic failures of these aircraft within two years of being placed into service. They would simply disappear somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean and they traced the failures back to fatigue cracks were growing from the stress concentrators associated with those windows and propagating through the fuselage until during pressurization they would reach a catastrophic stress level. We now have the ability using Fusion 360 to simulate these things and understand what's going on. So this is an example of an aircraft fuselage modeled as a cylinder with an appropriate wall thickness and the appropriate diameter and the windows which are 50 centimeters apart on center and measure 15 by 32 centimeters. Those windows create stress concentrators and I zoom in and show some of those stress concentrations right here. But interestingly enough this is the best example of a tensile mean stress stress state. When you're on the ground, you're at zero gauge pressure. When you go to altitude, you increase the internal pressure so that the passengers feel the equivalent of an 8,000 foot altitude. That cycles the internal pressure in this pressure vessel from zero to roughly 0 0.075 megapascals. That cyclic load can eventually lead to fatigue failure and the fatigue failure is brought about in regions of local stress concentration. So we need to know the stress state and we need to know the stress concentration factor. In the case of a pressure vessel, we have a bi axial stress state, which includes a hoop stress, which wraps around the cylinder, and the longitudinal stress, which goes along the axis of the cylinder. So we have a biaxial stress state, and we must find an equivalent uniaxial stress to do the fatigue calculations. Of course, what we want to know is how long will the fuselage last? If it's made out of aluminum, it has no endurance limit. And so we have to use mean stress correction factors, von Mises equation, and we have to combine those things using a Baskin's law to predict the number of pressurizations to failure. Of course, the loading state is even more complicated than an internally pressurized cylinder because the wings are located somewhere along the length of this cylinder and there are dynamic loads that are brought about by the forces that are acting on the wings, the force of all the passengers and payload inside the aircraft, and all of the aerodynamic forces that are also applied to the aircraft. Now, I have shown you this a number of times. This captures all of the fatigue failure criteria that we have discussed on the tensile mean stress axis in this direction and the alternating stress axis along the y direction where we identify the endurance limit on the alternating stress axis, the yield strength, and then the yield strength and the ultimate along the mean stress axis. And we overlay on top of this, on top of this coordinate system, the Soderberg line, which connects the endurance limit in stress amplitude to the yield strength in mean stress, the modified Goodman line, which goes from the endurance strength down to the ultimate strength, the ASME elliptic, which connects the endurance to the yield strength using an elliptical function, and the Gerber line, which connects the endurance to the ultimate, again, using a parabolic sort of function. This represents a load line, and we talked about all of this stuff before. When you look at that equation, when you look at all of those failure criteria, they can all be mapped into these equations, which are shown in Table 6.6 in the Shigley book. The first row of which includes the failure criterion for infinite life in terms of stress amplitude, mean stress, fully corrected endurance strength, and ultimate tensile strength. The second line is the Langer yield line criterion. And from this first row up here, we can figure out the fatigue factor of safety for any given combination of stress amplitude and mean stress. If the fatigue factor of safety is 1, then this first equation up here is what applies. The same is true for the Gerber criterion, which shows up right here. 
And you will notice that the Gerber criterion has the mean stress in the denominator. And so it only works for mean stresses greater than zero. If you let your mean stress be equal to zero, this will explode. Same thing is true also for the ASME elliptic, where now the uh, fatigue factor of safety, and again, these factors of safety are for infinite life in these equations. We divide the stress amplitude by the endurance strength and square it. We add the mean stress divided by the yield strength squared. Take one over all that square root gives us the fatigue factor of safety for infinite life using the ASME elliptic failure criteria. Now, what if we're doing torsional loading, not bending? It turns out that uh, for test specimens that are perfectly polished, we don't see any mean stress effects, but for real materials in service, we can use a modified a Goodman equation. We're now instead of using bending stresses, we use torsional stresses. What we can do is we can calculate a fully corrected endurance strength using the torsional or shear loading correction factor, Kc equal to 0.59, which takes our normal endurance strength and converts it to a shear endurance strength. But you also know that you're going to need the ultimate tensile strength in order to find the constants for Baskin's law. And the ultimate tensile strength in shear is about 67% of the ultimate tensile strength in uniaxial loading. Now, no matter what the stress state, you have to use a criterion to combine the stresses. If you have more than one stress type ax acting, axial and shear, so tensile and shear stresses, you combine them using generally equation 514, which considers multi-axial loading and shear loading. That creates an equivalent uniaxial stress, which you can then use in your normal fatigue strength calculations. Now, the only rub with all of this is that we have to take the stress amplitude that's applied and consider the possibility that that stress amplitude may be magnified by a stress concentration factor associated with some location of stress concentration. So if we have a stress amplitude and a mean stress brought about by a cyclic bending moment, then we have to multiply that amplitude and mean stress by the appropriate fatigue stress concentration factor. This is a lengthy process that we have to go through. We have to find the elastic stress concentration factor. We got to figure out the notch sensitivity. We have to convert that elastic into a fatigue stress concentration factor. So there you go, nothing to it. We apply that stress concentration factor in bending to both the stress amplitude and mean stress in bending. Now imagine we also had an axial load being applied to the sample. And the axial load was also cyclic. And it was in phase with the cyclic bending. Well, we have to take that axial load and we have to convert that axial load into an equivalent bending stress before we can add those things together, even if they're acting in the same direction and on the same plane. So we take the axial load and we divide it by 0.85, which you'll remember is the load correction factor for axial loading. So in effect, we take the axial load and we magnify it. And we are only magnifying the stress amplitude. We multiply that by the appropriate fatigue stress concentration factor for axial loading. We take the mean stress and multiply it by the fatigue stress concentration factor for axial loading. We find the torsional stress amplitude, the torsional mean stress, and multiply it by their, its appropriate fatigue stress concentration factor. Add it all together and we get an equivalent stress amplitude and an equivalent mean stress, all of which can now go into our mean stress correction factors. The problem with all of this is that the stress concentration factors depend upon the mode of loading. So if we have a shouldered shaft, you've seen this all before, exposed to bending with a fillet radius R, we have to find the elastic stress concentration factor for that given load geometry at the given capital D over little d ratios and at the appropriate 
fillet radius divided by small diameter, r over d. In torsion, we have different stress concentration factors. So we have to find the elastic stress concentration factors in torsion, and we have to do the same thing for axial loading. So it becomes the long and complicated process, but the idea behind it is fairly straightforward.